excellent. Margot Taft Stevers poetry collections include cracked, the, include cracked Piano, Cabin, Berry, Ca, Cabin Carey Press, 2019, Ghost Moose, Catawampus Press, 2019, The Lunatic Ball, Catawampus Press, 2015, The Hudson Line, Main Street Rag, 2012, Frozen Spring, Midlist Press First Series Award, 2002, and Reading the Night Sky, Riverstone Press Poetry Chatbook Competition, 1996. She co-authored Looking East, William Howard Taft and the 1905 U.S. Diplomatic Mission to China. Zay Jiang, is that how you say that? Um, University Press, 2012. Her poems, essays, and reviews have appeared widely in magazines and anthologies, including Burst Daily, Prairie Schooner, Connecticut Review, Poem a Day on Poets.org, Academy of American Poets, Cincinnati Review, Upstreet, Plume, and Salamander. She is founder of the Hudson Valley Writers' Center and founding and current co-editor of Slapering Hall Press. She lives in Sleepy Hollow, New York. Welcome, Marco. Thank you, Gail, for that wonderful introduction. And I wanted to also thank Lisa Mulroney, Joseph and Josephine Loray and all the people in the Parkland Poet Society for organizing this series. And I'm excited to be reading with my good friends and poets who I so admire, Susanna H. Case and Sally Bloomis Dunn. And thanks to those who are attending. This is a cover of my new, new book, which you didn't mention, which was published this year in April by Broadstone Books, The End of Horses. The photograph is taken by Lynn Butler, who was in the audience, I'm not sure if she's still here, of wild horses rescued by a Navajo family and living in the Wind River Horse Sanctuary in Lander, Wyoming. And my proceeds from this book will go to the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. The poems are about, many of them are about the sixth extinction and some are about the fragility of the human family. I'm going to read a poem titled Galloping Bareback, Galloping Double Bareback. Down sandy edges of paved country roads without helmets, bareback, the sisters clung to each other, to the horse, to the tree-lined ways that snaked around and through, as if going somewhere were not the goal. Their bodies twinned, hair wind whipped, the triple rocking of legs pounding, the leaping beat of hooves. The girls struggle to stay the horse rippling through them like storm. Wind battered trees that framed the hush of birds silenced by their galloping. The muddy paths, the morning dove, soft eyed windows of distant houses. Head down, the quieted horse plowed through grasses, his massive form sleek, willowy. So much do they long for the beast's velvet nose to be buried in their arms. And I'm going to read a poem I haven't read before, Menarche. My body opens like a telescope from bed, always groping for blood, for oxygen, for stars, for points of light, for little idiosyncrasies of light. Spheres cylindrical press near my ear, my tongue moves sinew sinews, snap, slap the skein of skin. Hawks, dogs, everything runs the other way. The end stopped raindrops, little tablets, their curved bellies slap and flop. Below the ship enters, boat, prow, and beer. The hill is my bed and I lie down seasick, suddenly a woman. I wanted to read a poem in honor of Denise Levertoff. <clears throat> who I had the opportunity of studying with at MIT when I cross-registered for a workshop that she taught there. And she changed the course of my life and that of many of the other workshop part participants, maybe all of them. MIT Poetry Workshop 1969 for Denise Levertov. <clears throat> at 3 a.m., 400 cops breached Harvard's University Hall with clubs, helmets, visors, cans of mace. 
pushed 100 of us into a hallway, crushed and tear gassed us. Close to 75 injured, one ankle shattered. She would never take a normal step or run again. In paddy wagons, they hauled us to the Middlesex County Jail, boys in one cell, girls in another. In your MIT workshop, you told us we would meet only in our apartments, never in classrooms. You wanted to teach poetry to scientists. We demonstrated against the Vietnam War. When poets possess the ability to write, you told me, they do not own their gifts any more than people own land or animals. Poets are vessels from which poems emerge. Using a payphone, Mark and I called you from the protest against Hayakawa during a speech that January at Northeastern University. You were giving a poetry reading, but you didn't want to miss the protest. You brought several attendees to join the demonstration. We witnessed you emerging from the subway stop, your voice raised against the cops, closing in, your arms waving through tear gas. Police bludgeoned the young men who accompanied you and dragged them away. Later, you looked over my photos of the Harvard strike to find one for your new collection, Relearning the Alphabet. You thought the image of the students looking out at students looking in the half moon window resembled runes of an unknown language. Every summer of my life I've spent in Biddeford Pool, Maine, at least for some time. And it's a pl place that my family has loved since the 1800s. This salt marsh was once a killing field, Bitterford Pool, Maine. Always on the far edge of the lens, the snowy egret. As rows of two or three, we hunch over, lift binoculars in northern mist. Hunters excised egrets as from a seeping wound, erased almost an entire species for quill pens, boas, fancy hats. Sometimes whole egrets adorned ladies' heads. We trudge through sand, eiders dive down, duckling, ducklings bob like cork bottles, dowagers peck at pebbles and insects like sewing machines. Baby egrets abandoned in nests to starve, plumes sold for more than the price of gold. Now herring gulls crowd the rocks, fashions change. Mm -hmm. One of my sons is an organic farmer in Concord, New Hampshire, so I've spent some time there. <clears throat> and I don't know how many people are aware of the fact that the moose are dying off in New Hampshire and now also in Maine because of the tick population that has burgeoned and just gone way out of control as a result of global warming. Ghost moose. Searching for moose, the children run down to the river calling the already gone, the forgotten, to wallow in stench, the smell of skunk weeds. Moose calves become ghosts, rubbing fur, skin, scraping ticks off on tree bark. In mild winters, ticks multiply and multiply, occupy moose calves, killing them slowly. Their mothers witness starvation from blood loss. Moose calves resemble ghosts, tearing fur, skin, Calves waste away, wasted bodies frighten the forest floor. Foresters call April the month of death. Mm. And on perhaps a similar theme, I will read a poem in honor of the 1,100 mutilated dolphins that washed up on the shore of France several years ago. They had tried to get to the surface to breathe. Trawlers now work in pairs and drag a net between them. And as a result, the European dolphin is on its way to extinction. Ballad of the Dolphin. Ancient Greeks said they should be treated as humans. Their sailors would not kill dolphins. How I have thought of you caught in the fishermen's nets. They would set them to trap you to catch the tuna that swam under your schools. How the fishermen hung you still alive upside down. Your cries brought others. 
Fisherman grabbed you by your tail, strung you and turned you head down in water, tied you to lifting hooks and dragged you to the docks. If any of you are still alive, when they slung you on cement, they stabbed you. How last survivors turned the water red, leaping in panic, waiting to die. In a good catch, it took them three days to kill all of you. How mothers whose calves were entangled could not lift them to the surface. They listened to their helpless underwater clicks and sighs. How often I remember the whale skippers who had radioed the location of hundreds of you, allowing tuna fishermen to track down your entire pod. Their nets deep, foaming, wide, so that hundreds could fit inside. How they used underwater sound to confuse and drive you down. How many of you drowned? Fishermen did not want to compete with you, but killing you was not enough. How they used the screams of several to slaughter more. How one of you hangs from the prow, still alive, calling, calling. I actually took notes for that poem in, about, in the 1980s. <clears throat> and then I found them about maybe a couple of years ago and started working on the poem. But I, I just couldn't work on it when I first read it. It was so horrible. But it's still happening, of course. And now the dolphin's becoming extinct. Um, not too many years ago, the subtext for the following poem, the title poem, would have seemed implausible. End of horses. I write to you from the end of the time zone. You must realize that nothing survived after the horses were slaughtered. We sleep below the hollow burned out stars. We look into dust bowls searching for horses. When you walk in the country, you will be shocked to meet substantial masses on the road. We do not know whom to blame or where the horses were driven, who slaughtered them or for what purpose. Had the horses slept under the linden trees, the generals and engineers pucker and snore on the veranda. And this is my last poem, which is the last poem in the book, Ocean Birds. Jealous is the night, the feckless night, coming over us as water into sea, the forceful day's geography turned black. Your body is the sea I float upon, your skin becomes the waves. Nothing will ever bring you here to me. Nothing will ever call you back. Thank you.